about what other systems are there. And again, as I said, for this project, I want you to have an alternative. Give me what is the estimate and what is the heat load required using hot water or forced air. Because those two seem to be the most dominant to uh, heating systems. Uh, one of you said, which I, I like that answer, one of the disadvantages of having hydronic system or hot water system is you cannot use it for cooling. That's a good answer because that's true. Now a lot of people are thinking of uh, if I'm going to put a system, might as well have it doing heating and cooling. And if I have forced hot air or forced air, I can use that in the winter for heating and in the summer for cooling. So that's a good, good answer. So what are the options? I, again, a lot of people now will sacrifice the comfort of hydronic or what we use or what they are used to to get the uh, advantage of uh, cooling. So what are we going to discuss? Types of heating systems. Can we name some? Hot water, mm -hmm. steam. Mm -hmm. Warm air. Warm air. Uh, split. split. What else? Uh, hot floor. Rated hot floor. Rated floor. Uh, variable flow. Variable flow. Variable flow is very kind of like the minutes split, the same thing. Yeah, but it, you could use, use um, heat and cool at the same time. Yeah, the same heat pumps. Heat pumps. So yeah. what, are, what are the heat sources we have? For now, we're still burning fossil fuel for heat, <clears throat> no matter what. Even though we have uh, forced hot air a few months of the, of the year, we will need to use uh, combustion. We will talk about efficiencies again. Can somebody tell me what is efficiency? No? How do you talk about efficiency? Somebody? Oh, divide uh -huh. the BTU output by what you're putting in. Exactly. It's uh, what you get out, out of what you put in. So efficiency. Output. Over input. If you get a number more than one, you don't have, you have reversed it. No way you get efficiency more than 100. You can get 99, but it'll never be 100. So we want to understand what is efficiency. When we say a system is efficient, what are we talking about? What is it doing? And heat distribution systems. So again, we said we will make the heat somewhere, either by combustion or by a refrigeration cycle. And how do we distribute that heat throughout the house? And again, when you do your project, you're doing the uh, complete heat load, then you have to distribute that to all the other rooms. We'll talk about that as well. Hydronic system, what do we use to distribute the heat? Either baseboard radiators, steam radiators, or radiant flow. Hot water system, radiators, radiant flow heating, or we can use steam. Steam is still being used because it has been installed for a while, it was very common. Uh, however, new systems do not go with steam, usually they go with hot water systems. Forced hot air, or forced air systems, that could be either hot and cold, and you can, you'll have to use ducts to distribute the air into the house, or you can use mini splits for high velocity distribution, which is not getting that popular anymore, but there's small, high velocity distribution. Fuel we use for combustion and why? And I have a good updated slide here I want to show you. So, so far, this is from 2002. Natural gas is 49%. Desire. Sorry. Natural gas is 49%. Electricity, that's using electricity to use heat, which means we're using air pumps or heat pumps. Wood is 2%. Fuel oil, 6%. It's not a lot. Propane. <coughs> as LPG, again, still petroleum, and these are some houses that do not have heating equipment. Let me show you the slide.
So read through this a little bit. This is very updated. This is from 2000. It's not the progress we have since 2001 to 2017. It's very promising. So coal was very dominant by 30%. Natural gas was 32. Nuclear is 20%. And other are like uh, hydro. So we are switching from coal to natural gas. So even though nuclear, I mean uh, hydro and solar were very small, they made steady progress. So notice the, the graphic has changed. That's in 2005. So in 2005, gas production improved compared to nuclear, I mean to coal. This is state by state, some major states. And if you look at this graph here, that shows you, you what's happening here. So only states in the Midwest are using coal. We are getting more and more into gas, even the southern part of the state is gas, California is gas. A lot of states are going into gas and they're doing hydrofracking, which is basically exploiting rocks, because gas is trapped between rocks and the earth crust. So when we frack and do some kind of small minor explosions, the gas will be moved around and they can suck the gas coming out. Uh, nuclear, still have nuclear in Jersey, North and South uh, Carolina, and Arizona. Uh, hydroelectric got more popular. Uh, I think, what is this? Yeah, South Dakota, Dakota, South Dakota, Maine, and Vermont, they have a lot of hydro. Petroleum, when we say petroleum, we mean fuel oil. And these are those little islands here. So you can go to this website and you can put a state and see what is the progress. So let's look at it. Go next to Texas. Texas. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So 66% of Massachusetts is, is uh, natural gas. We have some coal. But what's that 30% over there? Oh, sure. The West. 15? Don't go up. Natural coal. gas. Yeah, this is the growth. You see a lot of trucks in Massachusetts to be natural gas. So this is the, the years from 2001. It was thir uh, gas was 30%, 30, 22. 22 is uh, oil. So now? It's a matter of pipelines. That's why it's not in the middle of the country, a lot of that. True, and also like that. Uh, it's all over the coast with the natural gas, because it's easier to pipe it in. They can't get the environmentalists let this also, pipeline. No, in. also the sources. Well, yeah, what comes in on that? But you can't, you're not going to put a, an east-west pipeline. No, no. Yeah. Way. So they want one from local. Alberta down, you know, down to the Gulf. So now we have 66% gas, natural gas, almost 70%. Nuclear, very small amount. Coal is fading away, very small, which is good. Solar is getting popularity, and small, a little bit of hydro. We don't have a lot of rivers with a lot of streams, so not a lot of hydro, but mostly natural gas. Which is good because because uh, natural gas burns the, uh, easily and it's good for the environment. However, we would like to move more towards renewables. And uh, for renewables, I think Massachusetts have a big uh, resource of wind, especially offshore wind, like near Cape, Cape Cod or in the ocean. And there's a lot of uh, underwater uh, turbines as well. So this is. Uh, From probably 2003, uh, we have increased in the state of Massachusetts from, uh, uh, for natural gas from 49 to almost 70%. Uh, so when we compare a system to system, we're going to compare the cost of installation and the cost also of running. So again, when you compare something, let's say it's the most efficient, comparing to what, what did you put in the comparison. Performance. How does it perform in terms of efficiency? How much you put in and how much you get out of that? How does it perform in terms of distribution? A lot of the problem of distribution when it comes to hot air is leakage and losing heat by the time you get to the room. Usage, how often do we use it? If we put a system that we only use for one month, you're going to divide by the longevity of the system. 
using for one month, if that make it efficient or not efficient, probably not that, not that is efficient. Especially if you have to maintain the system every time you turn it on. Again, compare it to what? So when you go to assist to a customer or try to do an installation, okay, I compare this hot water system to forest air. This is how much it will cost you, this is the efficiency, the burning efficiency and distribution efficiency. Uh, again, if you work with the forest hot air or forest air in general, you're gonna have to put some duct. Duct installation is very expensive and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, leakage. Again, you have to compare things equally and see how much I'm getting out of that heat from the source all the way to the room. So comparison always has to be done in the, to another system. So the first thing is the electrical heaters. This is the cheapest way to put heat into your house. As what, when I say it's the cheapest, what am I referring to? Install. An install. What it cost, it's going to really put a hole in your wall. It's going to be expensive. So, so one kilowatt will give you 3,400 BTUs. So which will be enough to hit medium-sized room, but how much is a kilowatt? 15 cents. So every hour you clean that room, you, you are paying 15 cents. Well, it's just about one room, right? Yeah. So it's going to be expensive. So if you have electrical heaters in your house, probably you're paying around seven to $800 a month in electricity bill. And if you look at the electricity bill, it goes with the tariffs. Is that what it's called, tariffs? Like uh, tariffs? This first tariff, second tariff. So if you use from, from zero to, for example, uh, 40 kilowatts, they charge you 15 cents. If you more, use more than that, they'll increase the cost to 20 cents per minute and so on and so forth. So if you analyze your electricity bill a little bit, it will tell you how much you're using and when, and that kind of will give you an idea of what's happening. Also, the tariff and the cost of kilowatts depends on the time of the day. So if you're using uh, electricity in the middle of the day, probably it's uh, more expensive than late at night. So you can, at some point, choose to do your laundry at night, if you can't question. They sell a couple of boxes now. You can put one on your in your main box of your house and you can monitor with your smartphone, or you yeah. can put them on individual appliances to see where you're leaking all yeah. the fumes. And also, they, they also want you to monitor your, your, your usage so if you're at home and you can look at your phone and see your house is spending a lot of this, you want to you know why. Does your oil burner use electricity? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Your motor is running. Your electrodes are running. So as you run that motor, you are using electricity. So that is there. The efficiency, that's in terms of how much I put in and how much I get out, is 99.5%. So I put one kilowatt, I will get almost 3,300 BTUs out. So it's very efficient. So we cannot say that efficiency is not there when it comes to electrical heaters. It is very efficient. These what they look like. You can put these in a duct system and have it heat the, the air and circulate. Or you can have small baseboards, like this one. But instead of the, of the tube in the middle, what are you gonna have? A coil or a small tube that you plug it into the wall. So it comes with a with extension cord, you plug it in, and it will heat your house. And they have the portable one as well. Small with the fan and regular one with no fan. It looks like a like a steam radiator. It has big things with each other and it will heat. But uh, this is one of the common ones. And you can also put these in water. Some of them are submerged into the into you just have water? Say, yeah, let's say it's a different one, but it looks the same. So let's say you have a hot water system in the house. The boil, the boiler broke. You don't want to pay five thousand dollars to change the boiler. Uh, if you want five thousand dollars, five thousand dollars money. Yeah. So you gotta have a cheap solution. You can submerge a coil inside the water and plug it in, and it will heat the water, and the water will distribute the same way into the house. So mm -hmm. Nothing will change the system. It's cheaper but you put the big, big, huge electrical coil inside the, the tank. It's not a good uh, solution. It's temporarily, but it's doable. Advantage again, <coughs> economical, quick to install. You can get that thing done in one day. Easy to replace. Do not require piping, especially if you're gonna put a heater in every room. 
easy on and off control. Either it's on or it's off. While it is the thermostat, turn it on and off. Uh, can be located in very tight locations, which is gives you an idea. If I'm going to heat a small room or a garage that only I use for like once a month, maybe it's better obvious to put a reticle here and in there for the time when I'm in the room instead of doing a piping and having too much wall of piping when I'm not using it. So for a garage, for a hobby room, for an office, maybe better off just putting an electrical heater. We'll put an undersized uh, radiator, and whenever you're there, you just crank up the electrical heater. So not to uh, ditch all the electrical heaters completely, they do a very good job when it comes to small spaces and when the usage is not that high. So think about that again. When you do your project, there's a small room, that there's not a lot of uh, space to put a big radiator, you can put a small radiator and subsidize that with electrical heaters. Uh, quick active, there's no waiting for time, no waiting time for a starter. You turn it on, it comes up right away. Within like two minutes, the room is warm. Especially if you have a forced convection radiator. Those are the other ones you buy, and there are more advanced ones that they act as a convector. There's, you see three or four, very hot rods or blowing hot ceramics and air blowing through it and that will heat the space very quickly. They are easy to clean and maintain. No, no really involved cleaning and maintenance. Basically you have to swipe off the dust that's stuck to the, fin the fins and that's it. And when the heat element goes out, you probably can buy another heat element and they're not that expensive. They're very economical. Disadvantages, high operation cost. That's the biggest disadvantage of uh, electrical heaters. It's going to run your, your electricity bill very high. Can cause electrical hazard. If you look at those space heaters, they are equipped with a lot of safety feature. If it tips over, it's going to turn off. If it exceeds the heat, it should turn off. And if you touch the cord, probably it's very, very hot. And they tell you do not use extension cords with space heaters, plug them directly into the wall. So with 1500 watts, I got a watt. If you're drawing around like 15 amps, around 15 amps, 14 amps, which is a lot of amperage. So that could be a big fire hazard if you go with a uh, non certified cord or if there's too much load in that circuit. So can go to electrical hazard if not used properly. And it's not, it's not something you want to wire yourself. If it's a built-in, you will you will have to have a license electrician comes and put it in for you, yeah. Okay, so like you were just saying, if you want to have electrical baseboard, an electrician has to wire the whole thing in or yeah. Yeah. wire it into the panel or can the technician do the room by room stuff? They have to do it room by room and they have to check the circuit. They want to check what is the load on the circuit and make sure that the, the circuit can take that heater. Because if you think of, if you have a three foot radiator that is electrical, they want to make sure that the amount of draw happened with the, by the amperage is, do not exceed the circuit amperage. What is the circuit amperage, the average circuit amperage for each house? 15. 15. So you, you want to make sure it's 15. If it's not 15, probably they will go and have to change the wiring. They have to wire the whole thing directly from the uh, control panel and put 20 amps on it. And it will have its own wire. That's why when you also wire an oven or a uh, big microwave, it has its own circuit and its own wiring all the way to the panel. And the reason being, they have to put the right amount of, uh, I mean, the right gauge wire and cable. Most wires are designed to handle 15 amps. So if you exceed 15 amps, probably you have to have a thicker wire, bigger gauge. It's a small gauge, even bigger wire. It does not condition the air. It does not fil filter particles in the air and it will dry the air faster because again, the air is being heated inside that room and eventually it will dry the air to thermal dryer. So that's another disadvantage. Uh, heating elements wears out after time. It does not always remain the same. It has uh, tungsten, manganese mixed with steel that's the same heating element in your oven. So if you notice when you buy a new coil in your oven or your stove, it doesn't mean it, hot, it gets hot quickly and it glows red quickly. 
after a few years, you will think it's not giving you enough heat. Probably within five years, you have to change that heating element. And it's not that expensive to buy from home. Think about 10 bucks a piece. It's not that expensive. But they do wear out after time. The resistance inside the, the, the coil changes over time because of the constant heating and unheating. So it has to be changed. They require specialty wiring. The wire has to be large enough to handle the amount of amperage that's being grown. Otherwise, it will overheat and will can cause an electrical fire. Second type is heat pump, and we are still on electrical heaters because heating pumps are basically air conditioners. They use the refrigeration cycle to pump the heat from outside to the inside. I mean, even now, when it's uh, 32 degrees outside, there are still some BTUs that you can soak and pump into your room. However, the efficiency goes down as the temperature outside is lower, which makes sense if there's a lot of heat outside. If it's 60 outside, it's easier to collect BTUs from 60 degrees than to collect BTUs from zero or minus 10. So we go back again to our equation. Delta T goes down, the heat transfer will go down. So if it gets between zero outside, it will be difficult to absorb the heat into the coil once you have your condenser, your condenser evaporator. What is outside? Condenser. So the condenser will, will be it will be difficult for the condenser to gather more heat and pump it into the inside. So the, the, the unit will be less efficient during the winter. Fujitsu is one of the main companies that <clears throat> make really decent uh, heat pumps. Fujitsu and Mitsubishi. We have one here that actually supplies heat to this classroom, the office and the other classroom. They're not that big. They're very efficient to install. Uh, installation of uh, heat pumps is very very critical. You will have to go through at least six months of training and being in a with somebody because they are very specifically designed to run at very small and tiny conditions. Like any variation will upset the system and the compressor are very quiet, very small. They're trying to, co to compress everything into small unit. So the installation is very critical. The pitch could be an issue which is very important. The location is, can be an issue, and also the amount of refrigerant in the, in the compressor has to be precise. If you lower the refrigerant in your compressor, if it's low by a little bit, what will happen? The compressor will overwork. If the compressor overwork, it will eventually burn out. And you can tell that the compressor here is very small. It's not that big, but it, it's doing the job properly. And of course, there's a reversing valve that will reverse the operation. So think if your air conditioner in the summer, what you're doing in the winter is just taking it out, putting it to the outside. And if it's if it has the right compression ratio, it should be able to change the air between the inside and outside. Uh, probably Bill will talk to you plenty about heat pumps, but heat pumps are getting a lot of popularity now because they're getting more and more efficient. So can however, it's not an option that you can rely on completely. As we said, as the temperature difference in, uh, increase, it's, it will be uh, the efficiency will decrease. It will consume more power. The compressor has to pump harder. So if you have heat pumps, it would be great, efficient. They heat the house from at least March till December. <coughs> from January and February, probably you're gonna have some kind of backup heat. Otherwise, you will have to some big systems. They will have uh, a heating coil in them subsidized for the extra heat. And that will run your heating bill very hard. So, so now they can work in very cold climate, but they will be not as efficient as if they are in, cold, in hotter climate. So that's an option. The advantages of mini splits is there is no duct, there is no piping. You only have to run one refrigerant line all the way to the unit in the room. And it goes on vacation. So this one will pump 
hot air, the classroom, even though they can push it in the hallway, so far away, they can go up to 100 yards in distance. You just have to add the proper uh, amount of refrigerant. So what, that's what they do. Basically, somebody thought, okay, the AC is pumping hot air to the outside. What if I can make it pump hot air into the inside? So you, this you can split inside the house, and in the summertime, the heat is pumped to the outside and from the inside. So we'll soak up the heat from the inside and pump it to the outside. That's why they call it the heat pump. We're not generating cold, we're just taking up heat. And in the winter time, the heat is absorbed from the outside, even though it's counterintuitive because outside is very cold. But there are still some DTUs and some heat. Uh, Again, even, even at zero or minus 10, there are still some BTUs outside. However, it will take longer time and more energy to absorb it. Uh, think about it also as when we talk about pumping. It's easier to pump water from high flow with a lot of volume. If you have small water, small amount of water, and it's very low, it's really hard to pump that to the top. Advantages. Can be used for both heating and cooling. That's a really good advantage, especially if it's a small place. Uh, that'll be very beneficial and very efficient. Like in this in this classroom, I'm using actually two heat pumps. There's one on the top, on the outside, and there's mini splits here. So mini splits or ductlet, they're not required duct. So you only have one unit that will pump and distribute air throughout the class. The other system here, you can see it has duct system and it has better distribution and it is quieter. Even though the system itself is very close to the glass, so you can hear, you can hear it humming the whole time. This is more quiet. Uh, so we have two in this class. We have the duct system and also the mini split without ducts. So, and it can be used for heating and cooling and vice versa. Uh, relatively quiet operation because the compressor and the noise equipment is far away from the living space. So you only hear <coughs> the air pumping through the room. <coughs> So we turn this one on. The temperature now is 75. I'm going to put it to cooling. So it's pretty hot. So the air is coming, but you don't hear the, the compressor. So that's what you will hear. But it, it's relatively noisy, right? You can hear the air. Not so bad. It's not bad. Yeah, but in comparison with the with the duct system, you don't hear anything. You only feel the air drop because the look at the area where the air coming. It's very small. So the friction between the air and the and the office is really uh, high. Meanwhile, look at how many registers they have here. So if I turn on the other system, I'll hear the buzzing of the compressor, but I will not hear the air. But this is decent. The other issue is if I have a big living room, this will not have the same flow to cool the entire living room. So it's better to go with uh, different registers. Uh, it can be also used to condition the air. So you can put... Huh? Uh, it will take out moist because there's a, a water pump outside. It will collect all the condensate and pump it to the outside. You can put a filter on it, or ionic filter, run out the air and take all the particles and pollen. So for people who have asthma and have issues with pollen and allergies, you can couple that with with the filtration system. Let's involve installation, the hydraulic system. This can be installed in eight hours. Hydraulic system will take a week because you have to go and install all the piping system, find space for them, a lot of soldering involved. Uh, so that's another option. Very, very less involved. They require more maintenance. They'll be in the disadvantage now, we'll see that. Energy efficient, this is very energy efficient compared to heating coil. Can be zoned by using separate units. So for each floor you can have one of those, so each area you can have one of those. And you can, one unit, one, Cooling or heating unit can have six, uh, from four to six uh, inside units. So you have only one AC outside, but it can go for each 
one of those zones. So now we have one unit over there, it has four outlets. We have four inside units for all. One condenser. As advantages, it costs more than electrical coils. The cost, of course, is higher than putting just coils inside of the room. If a large unit is needed, that work is required for large spaces. So again, this unit will not be enough for the entire uh, room. That's why we have a secondary heat pump to have better distribution, and you can have you have to have, have, have put some duct system as well. Efficiency might decline in colder weather. It will decline in colder weather. So when it's zero outside the minus 10, it's going to be very inefficient. And that's when you always use secondary source of heat. And most thermostats here are wired to both a gas burner and also with a mini split. So it is it is programmed at a certain temperature. If the efficiency declines, we will kick in the emergency heat. Requires frequent maintenance. So what they don't tell you when they sell this mini split is it requires a lot of maintenance. Somebody has to come every year to measure the the amount of refrigerant in the system. Well, depending on how much it is. In most companies, they give you a 10-year warranty and they give you one annual free maintenance. So it depends on the contract that you have. But it's not something you have to skip on and do the maintenance for these units. They have warranty for 10 years, but somebody has to come and check the amount of uh, refrigerant, make sure the condenser is clean. Uh, again, the other thing that the Mitsubishi representatives, uh, representative told us is you have to clean the filter every two weeks. That is very and look where it is on the top. I'm gonna have go there a ladder, pick out the filter, and wash it and put it back. And some will tell you that if you don't clean the filter every two weeks, that will avoid the warranty. So that's uh, yeah. I'm gonna the last time you the filter. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks ago. Last week. Uh, we're not supposed to do the maintenance work here, but I don't think this has been ever cleaned. And we know we do not use this unit. We use the, the main one, but. Again, how often do you use it? But they tell you you have to change it every week. And if you look at the filter, it is a very thin and it can capture a lot of dust and particles. Especially in the summertime when you have a lot of pollen, you'll see a lot of things in the filter. If you if you don't change the filter, what will happen? Yeah, because you're plugging the, the vents, the air is not circulating as much, so the unit will decline in efficiency because it will overwork. So cleaning the filter is very important. If you don't put a filter on, let's say I took out the filter, what will get dirty? <coughs> the fins, the evaporator will get dirty and that's hard to to fix, uh, to, to clean. So when they go and clean your rivet once a year, they will go and clean on, clean the fins that they have special solution that's supposed to dissolve all the oils and all the dust that comes out and pump by the condensation uh, pump. Yeah. So with my um, Mitsubishi mini split, I've had to actually take out the fan a couple times to actually hose it off because of all the mold that I yeah. throw on it. Yeah. I mean, it is insane. It is part of the maintenance. And again, these are the things that they, they tell you at the end of the installation. They tell you have to clean this and that. And nobody pays attention to it. As David says, nobody cleans it. And it gets dirty and it breaks. They, they'll tell you you have to change the unit because you cannot do the right maintenance. However, depending on how much you use it, where do you install it? You have to, uh, you have to weigh the pros and cons for that. Not very study confusing. It's one of the issues also people complain about. But if you have a small room, I don't want this big thing in my room. So a lot of, you, you'll be surprised at how much the things. I've been noticing these in a lot of new housing. Yeah. Newer housing units. But a lot of people do not like the look of it. So they find them not that pleasing. And they actually come, there are companies who actually sell sticker to make them more decorative for covers or wood covers or some price to make them look nicer. If you think if, uh, if you have a house in Springfield with all this authentic look and the wood and colonial style and you put one of these, it will totally ruin the Yeah, it depends on where you want to put it. If you, it's not something you want to put in a museum or you start the building, but again, it's in your face, it's there. And even a window you see it, this, this, have this much uh, protrusion. 
That's something you have to think about. I mean, don't be surprised if people will say, I don't like the look of it. I don't want it in my room. Wood pellets. Wood pellets, it's a great option to have, especially in the winter time. If you have a, a heat pump, and then the month of February or uh, January, you want to have some subsidized heat, you can use wood pellets. <coughs> they are not as efficient as other stuff, but that is a good option, yeah. Can I tie that into an existing boiler and heat like another tank with the exhaust from that to uh, complement my boiler? I don't think so. I, I, I mean, I think it's possible, but I don't know how involved is that. I've seen people do a lot of funky uh, stuff. Yeah, it's doable, it's doable. Everything is doable. But uh, I don't think if, if it's the, I don't know if it's, if it's the code or not. But this unit, basically, you fill the top with the pellets and the heat. The heat will come, how much are these? Like around four or five hundred? That's the same as a wood stove. Yeah, okay. But uh, the advantage that it has, no, you can't put your, your wood pellets in it. It's just aesthetics. Yeah. Wood stove, you stick the wood inside. Or this one you fill from the top, and the idea behind this wood pellet is they will burn. They have a they have small motor that will blow air in it all the time, so the wood will burn almost 100 percent, and it does not uh, produce a lot of stove. So they're uh, an option. So I'll stop here and I will finish the stuff on Wednesday. But again, Tanya, I want you to please think about this option.